We're going to read out of first. We're going to go to first John two twenty, and then we're going to read a passage. We'll go to uh, Isaiah after that. But then my, my two main passages this morning that I wanted to read from one comes out of first John two twenty, a real small verse. But then I also wanted to read a little passage out of Samson, and really I think the life of Samson is is one of the main emphases of my uh, message this morning. I titled my message this morning, Does Your Compass Work? Question mark. Uh, because your direction determines your destination. Does your compass work? Because your direction determines your destination. So 1 John 2.20, I, I don't even know that I've ever preached on this since we started the church. Maybe I have this particular passage. It's a small verse. It has a lot of meaning to it. Uh, the old King James word right here doesn't really give us a clear understanding of what it means. I remember the old one of the old preachers I used to sit under used to preach this little verse all the time where he used this word all the time about this unction. You need an unction to function. All right. And so it says right here in first John two twenty. But you have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. So that word unction right there, I'm just going to write it on the board because I like to teach a little bit too. And actually in the Greek, if you were going to look at the word, it, it, it means, it says charisma. All right. And this is where we, we get the word charisma. Now, we have a lot of new people that come into church that haven't grown up in church. They didn't go to Pentecostal churches. Didn't, they don't even know what a charismatic church is. Uh, don't know the difference between Baptist and Catholic. Okay, or maybe they know the difference between Baptist and Catholic, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. Many of us that grew up in the Pentecostal type circles or gift preaching churches understand even the word charismatic. This was a common word that was used back in the 80s and the 90s. I go to a charismatic church. So the idea theologically of charismatic just simply means that it's a gift endued from God, divinely given gifts that have been given by God. So the idea is that the, a charismatic church operates in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The word charisma there, okay, or unction that we're talking about out of this verse, really specifically another way to, to word this, to say this word would literally be to say anointing. So you could say in this particular passage of scripture, you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Now, one of the things that I want you to know when it comes to the Christma, which literally means, uh, well, once again, it's, you could say anointing, but it literally means to be smeared. So in the Old Testament, whenever a priest or a king was anointed for the service of God, what would happen? He'd be smeared with oil. We've seen these stories before. The psalm talks about the fact that how, how beautiful it is when brethren in unity dwell. It's like the oil that dripped down the beard of Aaron. Remember, Aaron was the first high priest. The, the anointing oil of God poured upon the head, dripping down the beard of Aaron. It, just, it was descriptive of the day. I, I talk about this story all the time because I like to envision it in my mind when that young little shepherd boy was in the field. I don't know how they called him. I don't know if they blew the shofar, but whatever the case, the Bible said he was a ruddy young man, and I see him running in from the field with his little cheeks all red and he kind of steps back because in the little town he was from called Bethlehem the prophet of God is there and they're about ready to make a sacrifice they've already looked at all the boys of Jesse and none of them are going to be the next king and here comes the little boy Amen. from the shepherd from the from the field and next thing you know they're pouring oil on top of his head that day in front of the whole town they poured oil on top of David's head he was anointed for the service of God. When you and I get saved, we're smeared or anointed by God. Amen. Now, you know, we could get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We believe that there's an even further anointing or smearing of the oil of God upon the life of the believer after salvation. Amen. A second work of grace where when you cry out to God and you say, Lord, I want more of you. Baptize me. Fill me to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. That, that's when you're really anointed for service. But I got to tell you that on the day that you get saved, you're smeared. Ephesians 1.13 says that you that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. It's a down payment, the Bible teaches, on, on the final redemption. What does that mean? The final purchasing of the human body back from this earth whenever we receive our glorified body. When you get saved, you receive a sealing or a down payment of the Holy Spirit. And it's here to let you know that you now belong to God. You are a child of God. You've been smeared. You've received the charisma, the anointing, the unction. 
function. Amen. Now, one of the beautiful things is, is that the Holy Spirit is here to help us to function, to walk this life with God. The, the, the unction or the anointing wants to help us to understand things connected to God. Amen. As we travel this, this life. I wanted to show you a little closer. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 11. Verses uh, 1 through 2. And uh, it says, whenever we get to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, it's talking about the Messiah here. And we've talked about that a lot in the church, that the word Messiah, that that wasn't his last name, right? That was his title. The Messiah literally in the Hebrew means anointed one. So it's kind of interesting that, that that's because he is the anointed one. Now, this is what it's describing. It's describing the anointed one. The Messiah. But what you need to understand is that the, according to Romans chapter 8, 11, the same spirit that raised him from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. Right? It's not only going to bring life to you in the resurrection from the dead and the new life, but it's also going to bring life to you today so that you can walk, so that you can be smeared with the Holy Spirit of God. But it says right here, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, most of us know who Jesse was, but just so that we don't, that Jesse was David's uh, dad, right? So a, a, a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, one of the things that we've studied when we look at ancestry and we look at the various tribes, we understand that the promise came to Judah, somebody out of the tribe of Judah, because Jacob, the father of Judah, pronounced a blessing on him and that we were told that the king... The scepter, the king's staff, was not going to depart from Judah until it rested in the hands to the one to whom it belonged. We've also learned that, that David, the, the, the son of Jesse, is that Jesus, his lineage comes from David. So he's the fulfillment of all these prophecies that spoke of the one that was coming. And so what this is talking about is that there's going to be a rod that's going to come out of Jesse. Now, I'm not trying to get too technical on you, and sometimes I have a fault of doing that, but Isaiah is about 700 B.C., right? And, and so <clears throat> uh, what we need to understand is that's about 300 years after David's already been king. And so he's prophesying 300 years after David's been king, and what he's saying is that there's going to come life out of the root system of Jesse. A branch is going to grow out of his roots. Next verse. He says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So all of these attributes of how the Holy Spirit is going to be connected to the Messiah, because the same Holy Spirit gives life to our mortal bodies, these things also are connected to us through Christ. Amen? We talk about that all the time. You have access to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit because of what Messiah, Jesus Christ, the, the living one, did for you when he died on the cross and, and paid the penalty for your sin. When he removed the sin barrier that was between you and the Father, Father, amen. He gave you access to the presence of God, which allows the, the gifts of the Spirit, which allows the, the presence of the Holy Spirit to flow and to bring life into your mortal bodies, right? But he says right here, he says, the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, what I want to talk up to you real quick about is that, first of all, it says that the, the, the Spirit of the Lord is going to rest upon him. I've already mentioned it once, but Ephesians 1.13, when you get saved, you get sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. When you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to rest upon you. Amen? And so I'm talking about the believer right now and the connection of the Holy Spirit in his life because we're talking about the anointing. Real quick, I want you to, I just want to look at a couple of these words. Wisdom. The Spirit of Wisdom. The word wisdom literally in the Hebrew right here means skillful, specifically skill in war. One of the things that I think about when I talk about when I think of wisdom is that skill is, is the ability to apply knowledge. See, you can know a lot of knowledge. I love teaching Proverbs. You can know a lot of knowledge. To understand God starts with knowledge to, to some extent. You have to have some level of knowledge. There, there is something having to do with our head in all of this. You know, I always say it and I love, to, I love to repeat it. Brother Larson used to say all the time, you don't need to know a whole lot, but you still need to know something in order to get saved. But you need to know some things in order to continue to walk with the Lord. If you don't know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, you're never going to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've got to have some knowledge. 
But the difference between knowing something and applying that knowledge, that's where wisdom comes in. Wisdom is actually a skill that is learned. It has to be practiced. But guess what? It's still coming from God. Amen. Right. You, you can know a lot of things, but still not apply them in the right circumstances. God still gives the gift in order to be able to apply the knowledge that he's given in the situation. Let, let me give you a practical example. If you never open up the book of God, you're never going to have the knowledge of God on the inside of your person. Therefore, when you face a circumstance in real life, you're never going to be able to apply the knowledge of God in that circumstance because of the fact that you've never even learned the knowledge of God. Does that make Amen. sense? Amen. That's why we have to apply ourselves to be a workman to rightly devise the word of truth so that we not be ashamed. Amen. So, But to know the knowledge, we still have to be able to apply the knowledge. To be truthful, as you walk through life and you begin to take the knowledge that God has given you and you face daily circumstances and you begin to apply that knowledge that you've learned from God, you become better and better and better, more adept at applying the knowledge of God. It becomes wisdom. Amen. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves and gives you wisdom for situations. Counsel. The spirit of counsel. Simply stated, it means advice. Well, whenever we're traveling this life, we need advice from the counselor. The song that Danielle sang, he talked about he's a wonderful counselor. Amen. I don't know about you, but I need advice in this life. Listen to me. I've tried to go to men of God in the past. I'm not saying don't come talk to me. We'll talk. We'll pray. But let me tell you, you don't want the best advice is to get from the Lord because you, you have an unction. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know, listen, whenever I was asking advice about a situation and I could go on and on and on, I don't want to spend too much time. I wanted to ask the wisdom of other men of God and everything that they kept telling me, it was like going against my unction. And what I was feeling on the inside of my heart was something different than what they were telling me. But I didn't feel confident to trust what it was that I was hearing from the Lord because I didn't really know how to hear from the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to take into account what these men were telling me. And the whole time it was like the Lord was trying to shake me because as much as well-meaning as men might be, they cannot see into the future. They can say they're a prophet of God and all the thus says the Lord. Be careful with that too. But my point is, that's not saying it never happens. But my point is, is this, is that when the Holy Spirit has a work for your life, He wants to speak to you and He will lead and guide you through His peace. Amen. Amen. That's what the book of Philippians says, like the peace of God, if you read it in the Greek, be the umpire. The Holy Spirit in your life gives peace as you're walking in the direction that He would have you to go. If there's a bunch of chaos, amen, that doesn't mean there's never chaos around you. You could be knee deep in the midst of chaos and still have the peace of God operating Amen. in your life. Amen. Right. Amen. There's no safer place to be than right smack dab in the will of God. Amen. Amen. And no matter how bad it looks on the outside, Amen. if you're in the will of God, then God's peace is right there with you. I mean, Robert shared with me on multiple occasions, and I was using him as an example last week, whenever he was in prison. He doesn't mind me sharing this. When he was in prison, he said they could have told me, here's the key. I, and I would not have walked out. He knew that he was where he was supposed to be at that point in time. Actually, we got a guest this morning, and I ain't going to call no names out, but, but was a big influence in his life to help lead him to the Lord. And, and, and had a close relationship, and he was growing. Robert told me I was growing by, it was like Bible college. It was like the Holy Spirit was revealing. This is the anointing of God. This is the charisma of God moving and operating the unction of the Holy Spirit, moving and operating in our lives, doing for us what no man could ever do for us. Amen. Amen. And for that season of time, there were, you, you're not going to, you don't want to move outside of the charisma right. of God. You don't want to move to another place where God's anointing isn't flowing, right? Last thing I wanted to talk about regarding this particular passage is the fear of the Lord. Reverence and respect. The Spirit of God allows, in our relationship with God through Jesus, allows us to have a healthy reverence and respect for the Lord. A healthy reverence and respect for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life gives him wisdom for spiritual warfare. It gives him counsel for advice on which way to go in reference to spiritual decisions. But maybe most importantly, it gives him a reverence for God. It gives him a respect for the anointing that he's been given. Amen. Right, look, without a fear of the Lord in the life of the believer, we can have all the anointing God has to offer. But without submission 
It remains only potential and not manifest in our lives. We hear stories all the time of mighty men of God that were anointed greatly by God, but at the same time, they failed the Lord. Now, the truth be told, don't you look at me with your, you know, down with your holy eyes because each and every one of us in this room have failed the Lord after we got saved. And if we never got saved, we don't do nothing but fail the Lord. Right? But the good, but listen, a, a healthy respect or reverence for understanding what God has done in our lives. And listen, that's not always an easy thing. But it's very important for us to understand that. One of the most obviously anointed men in the Bible was Samson. I mean, it was obvious. It was a physical manifestation of an anointing that was operating in his life. At the same time, we know the story of Samson, right? Let's just take a real quick a look. Let's turn to Judges chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. We're talking about a compass this morning. Is it broken? Because, see, the direction that you're traveling will determine your destination, right? It says in Judges chapter 13... Starting in verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistine forty years. Now, I usually draw this big old timeline on the board, but we're not going to do that this morning. But what I am going to do is real quick, I just want to remind you that what God did was he called a man named Abraham, right? There was no nation called Israel at the time that God called Abraham. He called a man named Abraham who lived in southern Babylon, which is current day Iraq. And he said, come out of your father's house and I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless those who bless, who bless you, curse those who curse you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, the beautiful thing about that is that we can look backwards and know, because even Paul agreed, told us that. That ultimately what God's plan was in creating this nation called Israel was that he was going to give us the Messiah, Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. And that was the blessing for all the nations. Amen. And so God has already done that when we're in Judges. God has already called Abraham. Abraham has already had a son named Isaac. Isaac has had two sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob has had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? The, the, the Israelites, uh, there was a famine in the land, ended up under the favor of the Egyptian empire. And Joseph rose to the second in command. We remember that story, right? And then there was a time frame where after about 400 years or even a little bit before that, where the Bible teaches that there was a new Pharaoh that came to town that didn't know Joseph. And he enslaved the children of Israel. And even though they were in the midst of a bad place, even though they had been enslaved, guess what? God used that time frame in their lives to produce something good out of that situation. He allowed this nation to grow. See, the reason I'm saying that is because you might find yourself in situations sometimes where you feel like you're in bondage, where you don't feel like you don't know where to go. How am I going to get out of this situation? Good news, good news. If you belong to the Lord, he knows exactly where you are. Amen. The song that we sung first, it talked about the fact that he knows how many hairs are on your head. Amen. The problem that we have is we got to learn how to trust that no matter where we are, no matter what we're facing, no matter what it feels like, the God that we have chosen to give our life to voluntarily placed our faith in, knows where we are, and he can get us out of that circumstance. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the Lord that we serve. Amen. And so here they were in Egyptian bondage, but what God was allowing them to grow. He knew how to incubate his plan. Amen. And then they had been delivered out through the exodus, and they had wandered for 40 years in that wilderness. You remember that story. There's a whole lot that can be preached right there. Then under the leadership of Joshua, the Lord brought them into the promised land. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, after Joshua died, there was no leader to rise up. There comes the time frame of the judges. There's one verse in the book of Judges that is repeated on multiple occasions. It says, and in those days there was no king, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. The, the sign of what took place in Israel during those 400 years or so of, judge, of the judges was that they would do what it was that they thought. It, it reminds me very much of my old Christian wall. And Lord, I pray that that would never happen to my Christian walk again. That when you do what's right in your own eyes and the next thing you know, you fall and then you find yourself in the midst of a situation where you're so desperate, you cry out to the Lord. Good news, though. Listen, God's not. A, he will continue to hear the cry of the heart of his people. And every time they would fall and find themselves in a mess, they'd cry out to the Lord and the Lord would deliver them with a the judge. 
Here we have another situation right here. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. The Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and ne ne eat not any unclean thing, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now let's take a quick turn to Judges chapter 16, verse 21. <coughs> it says, But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Now let's take a look at Judges 16, 31. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtiah in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. So Samson had judged Israel 20 years. Israel was in a desperate need of salvation. Their desire to gratify or to satisfy their flesh had once again caused them to find themselves in bondage. This is the repeated story of the child of God from the beginning when God called Abraham to even now in the New Testament. I always like to say this when we preach the Old Testament, we're seeing Israel corporately as a corporate people traveling the life story and you can go back and look backwards at your own life and you can many times connect your life your circumstances to Israel where you see wrong turns taken where you see failures where you see bondages where you see yourself desperate where you repent and cry out to the Lord where the Lord comes in and he delivers you amen time and again we see these repeated stories happening to God's people, right? And so because of their desire to satisfy their flesh, we won't get into all the details this morning, they find themselves in bondage again. But then like in the story that we just read, God promised a supernatural birth was going to take place. Now, the beauty of this is that in a similar fashion for the New Testament saint, he knows that just as an angel of God told uh, Samson's mom what was going to happen, an angel of God showed up to young Mary on that day and told her that she also would have a supernatural birth. And we can look backwards and understand that that supernatural birth produced, gave us Jesus, amen, which ultimately allowed him to die for our sin and ultimately brought victory to God's people just as the birth of Samson for a period of time brought victory to God's people. There was so much anointing and so much potential in the life of Samson. And while he did many marvelous things for God, his life ended with him being blind, imprisoned, grinding like a slave, and ultimately dying. It, it resulted in his family having to go and find his mangled body from under the stones of the Philistines temple that had fallen on top of him. It seems as though even though he was anointed and given power from God, his compass didn't work very well. To be truthful, Samson isn't the only one of God's people who have traveled with a broken compass. His may very well be one of the most tragic, but it's certainly not the only one. As a matter of fact, there are characters throughout the Bible where we see that, you know what, sometimes their, their compass is functioning fine and they still find themselves in a mess. But sometimes it seems like their, their compass functions fine for a moment and then it's not really functioning very well afterwards. Examples of people that had good compasses. People like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You remember those stories? 
right? I mean, here you have examples of people. I mean, I like to tell this story all the time, but I did, I, I preached one time at home a Christian, and I remember Googling, how far is it from, and I just took a, a guess, because it was about 800 miles from, from, it, from Jerusalem to Babylon, all right? And so I Googled, I started trying to figure out, okay, well, how far would I have to go? And, and so what I Googled, what, what I came up with is about the same distance from home to San Antonio is about the distance that Jerusalem was from Babylon. And so one day you're a young teenage boy and you're playing in the streets doing whatever all Jewish kids did at that time. And Nebuchadnezzar's army shows up and he begins to bind and he takes the best ones. And you happen to be one of them. Your name's Daniel and your three buddies, Shadrach, well that wasn't really their Hebrew names, but you get the point. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you have to travel 800 years, 800 years, 800 miles to Babylon. And then you're thrown into this prison cell and, <clears throat> and you're told that you're going to eat whatever, but they took a stand. They said, no, we're not going to eat what the world has to offer. We're going to take a stand for the Lord. And even through their life, as they got a little more mature and they got older and, and, the, and the persecution got even more heavy and the time that they had written a decree because they were trying to bring down Daniel because he was having too much influence. And they said, you're going to pray to the God that, Nebuchadnezzar, that the king says you're going to pray to. And Daniel refused and when he found himself in the den of lions, right? But the Lord delivered him. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, same thing. Big old golden image. Every time you hear the music, the psaltery, the harp, and all these music start playing, you're going to bow down. You're going to worship the idol of this world. No, nope, we're not going to bow down, king. You might throw us in that fiery furnace. He said, but guess what? The Lord we know can deliver us. And even if he does, we're still not going to bow down. Thank God for a pre-tribulation rapture, but just in case you're here and there's a little bit of bad stuff that falls on America before the good Lord comes back and gets us, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, amen? amen. Because right there in the midst of that furnace, there was one likened unto the Son of Man that was with them. Hallelujah. Jesus showed up and delivered them, and their compass was working perfectly fine, and they find themselves in untoward situations. They didn't have anything to do with their disobedience. They were being obedient to the Lord. Praise God. God delivered them in those situations. Sometimes, though, like when I think of Moses, all right, when I think of Moses, Moses listened to the voice of God. And whenever God told him to deliver the children of Israel out, he did. He did what God asked him to do. He had some reservations, but ultimately he did what God asked him to do. He finds himself with his back up against the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army coming on him, right? And yet the Lord shows up and delivers him. His compass was working. It didn't look like it at first, but the Lord showed up. Amen. But then not in Numbers chapter 20, whenever God told him to speak to the rock, See, the first time God said, strike the rock. Well, I like that. If you go back and you read the first time God told Moses to strike the rock, he said, I'm going to go, God said, I'm going to go stand up on that rock over there and I want you to strike it. That's good. The judgment, the rod of judgment struck the Lord. Jesus is the rock. Jesus was stricken for our infirmities. He was stricken and judged for our sin. But the second, but you don't keep on crucifying Jesus. Jesus only had to die one time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And water flowed from that rock on that day. It was stricken. Amen. Because whenever Jesus died on the cross, hallelujah, and you put faith in that, the rivers of living water will flow in and out of you. Amen. But then the Lord said, now you can speak to the rock. Because see, now you can trust what God's word says about the Lord. Moses in a fit of anger. These rebellious people, he chooses to strike the rock. And I ain't making fun of Moses because Lord knows I, I probably strike the rock too. What ends up happening, though, is, is because he struck, he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock, Moses now was not able to enter into the promised land. He wasn't able to enter in. After all that hard work he had done for the Lord, he could not enter into the promises of God because of the fact that his compass at that point in time wasn't working. Really and truly, so far, I'm, my main point that I really want to make about all of this is that we can't automatically assume that when we find ourselves in a specific place, that that's where God intended us to be. I just want you to just to marinate on that for a moment. Because I talk about all the time how in Deuteronomy, how the Lord said, I have led you in this wilderness these 40 years. And because I wanted to show you what was in your heart. Amen. 
Listen, God is sovereign and He is in control of our lives. But if we're foolish enough to think that each time we find ourselves in a specific place, that that's where God intended us to be, that is not the truth. Amen. And listen to me, it doesn't mean... That I can remember one time when I was in my old church. <coughs> and I was sitting there. <coughs> it doesn't matter which one it was. But I was sitting there. And the preacher made a comment said, If you have a bunch of mess in your life... If you have a bunch of frustration in your life, if all kinds of stuff's going wrong in your life, you must be doing something right because the devil's mad. And I can remember just sitting in that chair thinking to myself, dude, the devil might be mad, but that ain't true. Because I made a whole lot of bad decisions. And that's why I got a bunch of chaos in my life. I'm just saying, it's not always that case. I think I made that clear from the text, right? But the truth is, at that point in time, the Lord revealed something to me. He said that he ain't talking to you, boy, because you made some bad decisions that have got your compasses broken. And you've gone in some bad directions, and your direction determines your destination. And you need to understand that, right? I, and so that morning is what happened. I, I felt in my life that the Lord was speaking to me and showed me. See, I just want you to know, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't matter where you are, how bad it looks, what the circumstances are. God can deliver you. Amen. He can show up. He can show up. He can do what needs to be done. And, and, and God, But God never intended for me to be there. <laughs> that was never his intention for me to be in that particular situation. Instead, it was my decisions that brought me to this place. As a matter of fact, listen to me, sometimes, only God can do this though. Don't be trying to help God out, okay? <laughs> because you can't make crazy decisions to put yourself in bad circumstances thinking, but I know the Lord works like this. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord. I'm just going to get me a little bit of this right here, take a little nibble, and see what happens in the end. Listen, the Lord knows who belongs to Him. That's the Lord right. will not leave you nor forsake you. You don't want to tempt the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen? It was never God's intention for people to end up in certain situations. And listen, even after the Lord delivers us, we can't sit here and act like there's not pain connected to those wrong choices that we've made. But hallelujah. In the midst of pain, God, if we cry out on the Lord, he knows how to do the work in our hearts. Amen. Amen. There are so many practical life choices that I think of regarding people's lives. You know, and listen to me, if some of this hits you in here, I can't even tell you how many people I talk to in the clinic where I work. I'd see sometimes 40 patients a day. And I sit here and I talk to these, and, and it's real life people. Mamas, single moms, that raising kids, the daddy doesn't want to really have anything to do with the kids. And they're going through circumstances and situations. And all of these things affect people's lives in so many different ways. And if it's happening out there in the world, it also happens to people in the church. It's just real life things that take place. You understand what I'm getting at? And I think of these things that people, you know, they have children and then they might get remarried. And so now you have children, different children from different people that are living between two different houses. And then the financial responsibilities that come with that child support and, and things of that nature. And sometimes it causes a financial strain. And then, and then if you're a Christian, you can't turn around and say, hmm, well, you know what? I don't feel like I'm going to pay that child support. Blah, blah, blah. Hold on a second. Wait, you just, that's your baby. It doesn't matter whether you made the right decision or not. That's your responsibility to, to, do, to pay that, okay? And yes, it may cause financial hardship, but guess what? I'm just being honest. In certain situations, God never intended for you to be there. I'm just being real. Don't get mad at me. Don't throw tomatoes at me. I'm just trying to say that many times God never intended for us to be in the situation that we were in to begin with. It doesn't mean he can't heal. doesn't mean he can't provide. doesn't mean he can't show up. And he will whenever we hope and trust in him. But instead of us looking at the situation and blaming everybody else that's involved in it, we need to sit back and reflect. We need to circumspect. We need to take the advice and the counsel of God. We need to realize, amen, that sometimes it's because our direction will end up determining our destination. And that's really what we're talking about. We talk about, I talk about this a lot. Why? Because it's been in my life. Misappropriation of funds. Not like in a felony sense, but in a sense of in my own personal life. I just spend money in the wrong place. Or I have in the past. Dude, I've spent money in the wrong place in the past. Got myself in a loaded debt. And I could blame it 
I'm just telling you what goes on in my mind, in my heart. I'm not trying to say it happens to you, but I can justify my actions because, oh, I went to college and I got all these degrees. I didn't have to get those student loans like I did. I didn't have to. Like, in some situations, there might have been a time when I needed one, but once I got the first student loan, it was like, oh, okay, this was easy. Let me get another student loan. And to be honest with you, I was misusing the funds. Get myself in this. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, give me an amen over there, brother. You yeah, right? And so I'm misusing the funds. And so now I find myself in the midst of a situation where I got to pay the money back. Right. But guess what? The Lord never intended for Matt to be there. He made a decision that put him in a certain direction and ended up in a destination. Hallelujah. But the Lord's moving. Amen. And I'm chunking away at it one little bit at a time. And pretty soon, hallelujah, I'm going to be real free when them girls get done with school. Amen. All right. <laughs> Uh, so we talk about decisions and relationships, the results that it causes, situations where we find ourselves because we navigated a broken compass and God never intended for us to be there. Sometimes we feel like the destination where we've ended up is a trap. Can you turn to Psalm 91 for me? Sometimes, once again, we feel like we ended up in a trap. Psalm 91 verses 3 and 4, actually. He says, Surely... He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. The snare of the fowler is a trap. I'm just letting you know. And then it says, and he shall cover thee with his feathers. This is an imagery of the Lord. You remember whenever he said, uh, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long I've desired to, to, to uh, gather you. Thank you. As a hen would gather her chicks. The idea is the feathers are the wings of a mother hen guarding and protecting its children. So that's the idea here. He wants to cover you with the feathers of his wings is describing protection. And under his wings, you shall trust his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Just that your protection, his truth, his word shall be your protection. Once again, this is a sign of the compass. God's word is our compass. Amen. Listen, but right real quick, I wanted to say sometimes our destination causes us to feel as though we're in the midst of a trap. In this particular parable right here, it's really a parable in a way, the snare of the fowler. See, a fowler was a bird trapper. I don't know if y'all were ever like me as a young boy. My daddy didn't really take me hunting because he wasn't much of a hunter. But I do remember being a little boy trying to catch birds. <laughs> had this old goofy little box deal set up. I actually caught one one time, a pigeon. Uh, I, I don't know. Pigeons are kind of dumb, I think. But no, well, maybe not. They're pretty smart. They use them to send messages. But, but anyway, I had a box with a stick and a string, and I put, like, some little grain out there, and I was, like, waiting, boy, for that there. Pow! And then I pull that stick, right, trying to catch that bird up under that box. That's what the, kind of like his stuff techniques were much better than Matt's, but that's what the snare of the fowler is. A fowler was a person who trapped birds. That's what a fowl is, a bird, okay? And so through some kind of a new system with some little sprinkled grain as bait, this fowler would set a snare for the bird. The Lord says that he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Amen? In other words, listen, the enemy is going to set traps and he's going to try to bait you and get you to come in. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. This is good preaching. That's the enemy of your soul. Listen, if there's a parable of the sower, and it's kind of switched around because the fowl in that story isn't the victim like it is in this story, but instead it's the enemy. But I'm just trying to say that the Bible in the, in the parable of the sower says this, that the fowl of the air came and ate the seed. In that case, the seed is the word of the Lord. And the fowl is the enemy. And the enemy, which is like the, 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 the fowler, is stealing the seed that, that wants to enter into the heart of man and give man an understanding of the ways of God. But the enemy comes in and he snatches it. He steals it out of the heart. Listen, God wants to give us a compass and help us to understand the, which direction to go in. But whenever we don't understand the word of God or we deny the word of God or we ignore the word of God, then what we find ourselves is we go in the wrong direction. We find ourselves caught in a trap. See, the problem that we often have is that with the compasses that God has given us, we just don't look at it <laughs> for, and for various reasons. I just let's look at Proverbs chapter three, verses five through six. 
I realize I'm a long-winded preacher. You know that? I got a revelation of that last Sunday. <laughs> I really want to try to do better. And I hope to this morning is better for you. But I think I preached an hour and 15 minutes last week. Yeah. That's just too long, man. All right. Huh? It was good? Thank you, sister. Man, it was long, too. I start knowing it's long when I see some of y'all back there the way y'all's faces look. I'm like, oh, man, you're too long now, preacher. <laughs> I want y'all to know I think about that. I just can't help myself, man. I ain't talking about Jesus. All right. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Amen? Amen. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense to my logical understanding when I see the pathway that God is bringing me. But he said, don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him. In all your ways. And if you'll do that, then he will direct your path. Now that word acknowledge has some meanings to it. It means knowledge. It means to be able to perceive. It means to discriminate. Which means to be able to make a distinction between two different things. Once again, the word of the Lord as a compass in our life, amen, wants to allow us to have some discrimination in our lives. And when we acknowledge the Lord in our situations, I told y'all this story a couple of weeks ago. It's just a good story. That associate pastor, we were talking about finances. He said, dude, I think I messed up what you think. He said, I bought my wife a brand new car, and I'm really thinking I should have bought a used car. And my point to him was, is that, can you afford the new car? Not really. It's going to put me in a bind. Well, there you go. Did the Lord try to tell you not to buy the new car? Yeah. Okay, well, there you go. Real simple. I mean, and I, don't, I didn't say it to him like that, but my point is, is that that, that was the point. You know, you've got to live within your means. Okay, we all need to live within our means. Amen. And, and, and yet at the same time, there's many times that we, that we don't. But he didn't acknowledge the Lord in that particular situation. He didn't ask for God's compass, God's guidance, God's direction in that particular situation. And so there now he's heading in a certain direction that's leading him to a certain destination. It doesn't mean that he'll never be able to get out of that. It doesn't mean if he's not faithful in paying his bills on top of whatever the case that that situation won't end and hopefully through that wisdom comes wisdom for the next decision wisdom for the next time that we do so it doesn't mean that it's always bad to buy a new car that's not what i'm saying lord knows if you're here the way mine sound in these days i'm thinking oh god i gave my sister a ride home and dude and she hears every noise in every car. <laughs> but I even knew this noise don't sound right. And so, but anyway, so sometimes a new car is not a bad thing, right? All right, anyway, you get the point, though. To acknowledge the Lord. The way we're able to perceive or discriminate or acknowledge God's will in all our ways and to be directed in the right direction is through an understanding and a submission to His Word. You know, related to this, there's a couple of different problems that can take place with God's word. First of all, there's a lack of understanding of God's word, but it's based upon our own laziness, right? Does that make, does that sound mean when I say that? No. Good. It's just true. A laziness and an unwillingness. That's why people don't like me. They don't want to stay there. I don't want to stay at the church. He's fussing and he's hollering at me and he just he told, you, told you the truth. Yeah, if we're lazy, unwilling to read the Bible, to learn for ourselves. I just want him to tell me what I need to know today. Burger King, give me a, give me a happy meal. Oh, well, that's a McDonald's. You get the point. Fix my little situation today. It don't work like that, mama. That's not how the Lord created you to be his child. He created you to be his child and he would give you charisma, anointing, so that you could understand the things. The Holy Spirit would give you revelation. He would give you wisdom as you put the knowledge of God on the inside of you. He would give you a compass and a give you the ability to, to go in the right direction so that it would determine the proper destination. And he gave you a free will to make a choice whether you're going to serve him or whether you're going to reject him today, tomorrow, next week, or for the entirety of your life. Amen? Amen. And that's the way that the Lord developed it. And that's the way it's going to continue to operate. And they got a whole lot of churches with a whole lot of preachers that are willing just to tell people happy, happy, and to, and to make them feel good so that they'll keep coming back, right? But but what we need is the counsel of the Lord. And then once we hear it, we need to submit to it. I'll preach it to the preacher. Probably more than what you realize, right? But anyway, a lack of understanding or a laziness connected to the fact that we have not done the work. 
right? Uh, or a lack of understanding because of false doctrine. Boy, Lord, I know I beat that horse dead over the first couple of years that we opened up this church. The fear or the, or the damage of false doctrine. It's rampant in the modern church. Oh, yeah. If you understand the scripture from an improper perspective, it don't matter how much you try to study it, your compass is all jacked up. You're supposed, you, it's telling you you're going north when you're really going south. Because it's a, because it's a compass that is not true. Right? Or, or an unwillingness to submit to the known truth of God. Each and every one of us in this room, if we're honest with one another, don't act like you done arrived. Because, see, some of your mistakes may not be as big as some of other people's mistakes in here, or at least not in your own eyes it's not. But nevertheless, you may have made choices not to submit to revelation that God has revealed to you. And, you, and if we sit here and we think that, that it's not heading us in a certain direction that's going to end up in a certain destination... We're wrong. Good news is God's long suffering and he's merciful and he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Praise Amen. God. He's long suffering in our lives. Praise God. He gives us time. Amen. But one day time will run out. It will. Amen. This brings us back to our main character this morning, which is Samson. Point number one of my message is this, is that the oil is precious. The anointing is is precious. Amen. You know, we talked about in the in the first passage when we read about the life of Samson, about the fact that God, the angel of the Lord, told Samson's mom, listen, don't drink any wine, don't drink any strong drink, don't put a razor to his head, because why? He's going to be a Nazarite from his birth. From the womb, he's going to be a Nazarite. So I want you imbibing or putting anything in your body that's going to break that vow. If you go back and you read Numbers chapter 6, it talks about the Nazarite vow. It wasn't somebody that was from Nazarene, the town where Jesus grew up. It was a specific vow that was spoken of in the book of Numbers chapter 6. And it was a vow that a person voluntarily gave to the Lord. It'd be kind of like a situation where the Lord revealed to you that you weren't supposed to. Because I get, not arguments, I used to, I don't know anymore, but. You know, oh, well, the Bible says you can drink some wine. I'm like, dude, now I used to sit there and try to prove it from them. I'm like, look, you do what you want. <laughs> I mean, I, I ain't arguing no more about this. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that a consecrated relationship with the Lord, a person makes the determination, I'm not going to drink alcohol. Okay, I'm talking about today, modern society. I'm not talking about the past right now. I don't feel like the Lord wants me to drink. When I drink, I know I like a Christian. All right. So, Lord, now I'm not talking about making a vow in your own strength because, Lord, knows I did that. You'll fail the Lord. I'm talking about, Lord, I know that you want me to live a separated life. I need your help from the Holy Spirit. Right. Because of what Jesus did at the cross to give me the strength that I need in order to walk right before you. I'm not going to take a little sip, a little nip, because I know what that's going to turn into for me. Right. Because that ain't enough. I'm an extremist. All right. And so if I get a little nip of that, next thing you know, Lord, help us. Right. We got a mess. Houston, we have a problem. Amen. All right. But what I'm trying to get at is, is that the anointing is precious. So in this particular passage, a Nazarite wasn't supposed to drink wine. Wasn't supposed to drink grape juice. Wasn't supposed to eat raisins. Don't have nothing to do. Listen, I don't know all of this. I'm, there's plenty of spiritual connection to it. I'm sure we're not getting that deep this morning with it. I'm just telling you what the Nazarite vow was. You know eat raisins, you don't want to eat plump grapes, you don't drink grape juice, you don't drink wine, you don't drink strong drink, you don't put a razor to your head, don't cut your hair, and you don't touch dead bodies. Alright, dead bodies were considered unclean. We already know that from the book of Leviticus. Those were some of the vows. Now, the thing about a Nazarite vow was that it was a voluntary thing given to God. And it was really for a short period of time. I'm going to take this Nazarite vow before the Lord because I want him to know that I love it. Amen. Lord, I love you. Sometimes, you know, people will fast. Lord, I just want you to know, hey, I'm down here, Lord. I want, to, I want, I want you to know I love you. I'm going on a fast. I'm going to read. I'm going to do this, right? And if your heart is right in that, fasting is a good thing. Lord, I, want to, I, want, I want you, just want you to know I'm here and that I love you because I know you love me, right? And so they would take this temporary vow before the Lord, and that's what he told her in Judges 13.5. I'm going to read that again real quick. For lo, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So that was, that was it. No partaking of great products, no touching dead carcasses, no shaving the head. You know, one of the things I'm talking about, point number one, the anointing is precious. The oil is precious. 
When I go back and I consider this story, I think of the fact that I don't know that it was that precious to Samson. I'm saying, woe is me. <laughs> woe is you. If we have the mentality of Samson, if we take lightly our salvation, if we take lightly the anointing that the Lord has laid upon our lives, I don't think it was really that important to Samson. I think Samson was probably a cool dude. You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, I, I mean, I'm not just trying to say that to, so that I sound cool. I'm just saying, I think Samson, if you look at Samson's life, he was kind of like always making jokes and stuff like that. And I think that it's fine to be a jokester, but sometimes I'm kind of worried that I may be a little bit more like Samson than I ought to be. I make a lot of jokes, and I don't know if I'm ever serious enough. I mean, just think about the way he played around with it, you know, with, with his with his wife. Oh yeah, well if you braid my hair into seven different things, and then you weave it in this little loom thing, that's what's going to really take away my strength. And then they come get him. And he's like, ha! I tricked you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and it's one thing after the other. He's doing all of these little tricks on him. He's playing around with the anointing. You know, he's like, he, he's messing with their head. Then, then whenever he goes back and he finds out that he, that he, he didn't even consummate his marriage because he wasn't even supposed to be looking for no woman down there, but he went to go get him one of them women. That's a whole other story from another place that he wasn't supposed to be going to get no woman from. And then when it's all said and done, he gets mad. I'm not going to get into the whole story. And whenever he gets mad, he, but then later he goes back to get his woman. He finds out that the daddy gave her to another man and Samson had paid money for him. He's like, wait, hold on a second. Say what? Oh, okay. That's how y'all want to play? Good. It's about to go down. And he goes and he catches him. The Bible says foxes, but most scholars believe they would have been more like jackals because jackals run in packs. He, he gathered up 300 of them and, and he tied their tails together and he put like a flame in between their tails and them things started running all up in the fields and caught all their fields on fire. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, and, and, and so Samson was like, y'all want to play with me? I'm going to show you. But I mean, just the way he did that, you can tell he's probably laughing the whole time. Like, yeah, you want to mess with me? I'll show y'all. Right. And so we see, but I see, I see this, this sense, this, this sense of humor that he has. And it's, he just seems like he's a likable guy and that he's got all this power. He's got all this anointing, but he's not really taking this anointing seriously. And one of the things I realized is that the Nazarite vow was one of voluntary. It was a voluntary vow. Samson didn't voluntarily take the Nazarite vow. God chose Samson for the vow. God said he's going to be a Nazarite from the time he's in your womb for the entirety of his life. Right? So he didn't choose the vow. God chose the vow for him. And I just think and wonder, did he really respect the anointing like he should have that God gave him? That's a, that's a sobering wake-up call for me. And hopefully it's a sobering wake-up call for you. It's a great price that Jesus paid for our salvation. Amen. It's a great price that Jesus paid so that his presence and his Holy Spirit would be able to move and operate in our lives. Amen. Amen. And unlike Samson, who didn't seem to really respect the anointing, we, by the grace of God, we, Lord, we need to give us the understanding to respect the charisma, the anointing, the unction Amen. that you have given us. Amen? Amen. So that was point number one. Point number two, the compass is broken. Judges 14.5. It says, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards. I never even really noticed right here that I guess he was traveling with his parents, but I don't think that they were all necessarily that close together. I didn't notice that before, but that's another story. Well, We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that one another day. But anyway, he went down to Timnath and he came because he's going to get that woman I was telling you about. And he came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold, a young lion roared against him. Well, first off, you know, I was thinking you need to tap your compass, Samson, because we already have a problem. Something's not working right because you're going down to the vineyards. Why are you going to vineyards when you ain't supposed to be eating grapes? Yeah, amen. Why are you walking all up in the vineyards when you're not supposed to be eating raisins? You're not supposed to be drinking grape juice. You're not supposed to be drinking no glass of wine. Why would you walk in the midst of a vineyard when you ain't supposed to be eating raisins or grapes? Why, Samson? Because you're not. Your compass is broken. You're not respecting the anointing of the Lord. You're not having the fear of the Lord in your life. And you're just lackadaisically acting like, oh, you got so much power. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Oh, you know the message of the cross. You got so much power in you uh, that you're just going to be able to walk anywhere you want, make any old decisions that you want. 
You're not supposed to be in the middle of those graves. But at this point, the good news is that God's will is still with him. The anointing, we need to understand this, it doesn't flee immediately. Amen. God's long-suffering and he's merciful and he's kind. But look at verse 6, Judges 14, 6. That lion showed up in the vineyard. Remember what it says? And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he ripped him. Which means there's another word for rip. He ripped him. As he would have ripped a kid. Not a child, but it's a baby goat. I mean, that's what Samson did with that lion. He just picked it up like it was a baby goat. He just ripped it in half. Because he was, that the anointing of God was so powerful on his life. And he says, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So that makes me understand they were on the journey with him, but they must not have been right there with him whenever he killed this lion, right? And so he ripped this lion in half, but he didn't tell him anything about it. He's just still walking on his merry way, going about his business. Didn't even bother him, man. He's just whistling and walking with his old fun loving self. But you know, there's a New Testament scripture in James 4, 4, 17. And in the scripture, it speaks of the fact that when a person knows right from wrong and they do the wrong thing, it's sin. Yep. It doesn't matter how small the thing may be. It's like looking at a broken compass. James four seventeen. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. When we start operating according to a broken compass, our sense of direction gets turned around. Lord knows my direction is all messed up anyway. I couldn't hunt and throw me in the swamp. I'd never come out. I'd be lost for sure. But that's my next point. I'm wandering in the wrong direction. His compass is broken and he's wandering in the wrong direction. Judges 14, 8 and 9. It says, and after a time he returned to take her. That's talking about that wife that he was going to get. He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Let me go see how that old thing is doing to try to attack me. And he said, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and he went on eating and came to his father and his mother. So he's like, look at that. that they got some bees up in there. Look at that honey. Oh, man. He grabbed him some honeycomb. I don't know how many times he got stung, but he wasn't too worried about it because Samson was cool, man. I'm telling you. And he's just walking down the road whistling. And he's over there eating honeycomb. He's dripping down his hands. And he's just going on his merry way. Not thinking twice about anything that he's doing. But the problem is, is that his compass is broken. He's heading in the wrong direction. And you were not supposed to touch a dead carcass because you took a Nazarite vow. You, he was not serious about the vow that had been placed upon his life. He was not serious about the anointing that was in his life. He wasn't serious about the work of God that was taking place in his life. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 and then we're going to go to 1 Timothy 4. Hebrews 3.13 says this. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, the truth of the matter is, is this, is that when you're heading down the wrong direction and you continue to go in the wrong direction and you continue to allow the wrong decisions to be made and you continue to walk in sin, sin is very deceitful and it will begin to harden you. 1 Timothy chapter 4 Verses 1 through 2 says this. It says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared. <coughs> That's what sin does. Okay, yes, we're talking about false doctrine right here. We're talking about what false, false doctrine, a bad compass, sends us in the wrong direction, right? But essentially, the wrong direction. Sin ultimately hardens our heart and it sears our conscience. And this is exactly what's happened in the Samson. He starts off walking in a vineyard when he's not supposed to be eating raisins. And the next thing you know, he's sticking his hand in a lion's carcass and he's eating honey out. The doctrines of the uh, <coughs> Samson started off too close to a cup of wine. And the next thing you know, he's eating honey out of a decaying lion. This is a progressive process that's taking place. And ultimately, you know, that was the title of my message, but this is point number three, the wrong direction and a bad destination. Judges 16, 21. We're getting near the end. Hang in there with him. It says, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Now, I don't know for sure if this is what it looked like. But I'm imagining, probably because I saw a picture of him when I was younger or something like that. But here's Samson, his eyes have been gouged out, burned out, whatever the case, however they did it. 
and he can't see nothing, and he's chained, and they just put him, chained him up against this big old, I don't know, I just imagine a bunch of spokes on a wheel of a log or something, and as he turns it, there's some kind of a gear system that has like some stones that roll over whatever he's grinding, and he's just over here walking in circles, blind, chained, and this is what he does every day. Oh, wow. Praise God. The yeah, good news is we got emergency lights, and I got... A, Got my notes on the phone. You can see. <laughs> well, that was blindness. Darkness. Well, that's kind of interesting because one of the things that, that I wanted you to know is, is that, and then also in the end, that last verse in 31 where it says his brethren went back to get him. And I told you already they had to dig him up out of that pile of rubble that was there. And we can say that in the end, Samson, we could say that in the end, Samson killed more Philistines in that last breath of life than he killed his whole life. And that's true. And before I'm done, I'm going to tell you that, right? Um, at the same time, I want you to know that we cannot consider that his final destination, we can't pretend that this is what God intended for Samson's life. You'll never convince me of that. I mean, does anybody agree with me? That God intended for Samson's life to be blinded and grinding as a prisoner of the Philistines. No, that's not what God intended for Samson's life. Can God work in it? Yes, absolutely. Can God accomplish something through it? Absolutely. He's the God that turns tragedy into triumph. But you'll never convince me that God intended for Samson to end up on that day where he ended up. But the reality of it is, is that decisions that he made to put him in a particular direction ended him up in a specific destination. You know, regarding the fact that the lights went out right there when I was talking about Samson being blind, one of the reasons I know that was never God's intention for Samson, names in the Old Testament, names in the Bible in general, mean something. You know, I learned something as I was studying this, for this message. Samson's name, you know what it meant? Does anybody know by any chance? It meant sunlight. Samson's name meant sunlight or brightness. Yet at the end of his life, he's blind. He's in darkness. He can't see. He's imprisoned by his enemy and he's in darkness. His poor family, once again, has to go and cover his mangled body. That wasn't God's will for Samson's life. But look at, look at verse 4. Because I put down here, but the oil of God burns bright. I would like to rewind a little bit in the story of Samson's life. Let's go real quick to Judges 16. And I'm really closing right here. Judges 16, verse 3. I got to give you some good news, amen. I can't leave you hanging like that, man. Poor Samson. He was a funny guy. He was a cool dude. God used him. But he made some bad mistakes. He didn't, he didn't reverence the anointing of the Lord. It says, And Samson lay till midnight. He was actually in one of these Philistine towns. It says, He arose at midnight and he took the doors of the gate. There was a watcher of the, of the city. And they would have seen Samson. They didn't like Samson because he was always, always messing up their lives. He says, he took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and he went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill before Hebron. That's a strong guy. But, I mean, his strength has to do with the anointing of the Lord. I mean, I'm guessing he was probably big and bowed up. I mean, I guess. Probably looked like they make him look like Hercules. and so I don't know that he looked like that. But it, but it wasn't just natural strength. I don't care how much you lift weights. You ain't strong like this. This is the anointing of the Lord. And what he does is he picks the gates up to the city and he just carries them out. You're not going to hold me in here. I'm breaking out. But you know, there's spiritual significance to this because the gates of the city talk about the strongholds of the city. Samson takes the gates of the enemy's city and he moves them out of the way. Now, there's a spiritual truth that I was reminded of right here. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Because once again, the city's gates represent its strength. It represents the fact that it's a fortress. It represents the fact that it has stability, that it has staying power. Not when Samson woke up that night at midnight. He didn't have no stability, didn't have no staying power. Samson just picked up them gates and he walked off with them. Amen. Because the power of the Lord was upon Samson. And in a similar New Testament concept. I want you to see this. This is what the Lord says. And Simon Peter answered the Lord and said, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one, Jesus. You know what that means? 
It means a lot more than what we're giving it credit for. It means that you are the very one that we have been waiting for, that when the garden, whenever Adam and Eve fell, and God spoke to the serpent and said, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head, that he was talking about that seed, and that seed was manifest in you, Jesus. That's who you are. You are the very one that God, when he promised Abraham that through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. You are that one, Jesus. You are the very one that says that the one that would come from David who would sit on an eternal throne you are that one Jesus you are the Christ you are the son of the living God you're the one we've been waiting for Jesus said flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you my father in heaven revealed that to you he says and I say also unto thee Peter that you are Peter little rock Catholic Church says that this is that the truth was founded on Peter. Victory was founded on Peter. No. The word Kepha, Cephas, another name for Peter means little rock. And in the Greek, it says, And upon this rock, big rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What truth are you going to build your church on Jesus? The fact that I am the promised one. You said it. The Lord revealed it to you. I am the one that God has been waiting, promising to send all of this time. And I'm going to offer my life on the cross in payment for the sin of humanity. And I'm going to break the bondage of the sin of humanity that lies over the people of God. And guess what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it because just as the anointing on Samson gave him the power that he needed to carry that enemy's fortress's gates away in a similar fashion but, but in a much more powerful fashion, the anointing of Jesus, hallelujah, that was upon his life when he took his sinless life to the cross and died in our place, set us free, and the gates of hell. God promises. Sometimes it might look like the gates of hell are prevailing in your life. Sometimes maybe your compass was broken. Sometimes maybe you made wrong directions, right? You were heading in the wrong destination. But I got good news for you today. The Lord said the gates of hell will not prevail against yeah. his work. Amen. Against his church. If you're part of the church and you're trusting in that God, amen, then guess what? The Lord will show victory in the midst of your life. Hallelujah. Good news is, is that at the end, is I just want you to know it's never too late. I'm closing with this. Really, I'm closing. I promise. <laughs> it's never too late. you got to understand that. As long as you got breath in your lungs, it's never too late. Because with the last breath in Samson's lungs, he told that little boy, he said, just, just go ahead and put my hands between these poles right here. Amen. Lord, because I know you've given me my strength back. Lord, I've made some bad decisions. But now that I've been grinding in this prison, I've been blind. I know my name was brightness and sunlight. I was supposed to be able to walk in the brightness of your anointing and instead now I find myself in darkness. I know you had a purpose for my life, Lord, so I'm going out. I'm going out today, but I'm going out with a bang and with the last breath in my lungs, I call on you, Lord, and I pray that you give me the strength that I need in order to do what it was that you called me to do. Hallelujah. And the power of the Lord showed up in Samson's life. Amen. And God used him even in that last moment of his life. I'm here to tell you it's never too late. No matter where you find yourself, I'm preaching to the preacher. We need to be willing to call out to the Lord.